Today on Cook's Country, Julia makes authentic southern style smothered chicken. Adam reviews the best kitchen timers. And Bridget makes mouth-watering apple pan dowdy. That's all right here on Cook's Country. The term soul food is rooted in jazz from the 1940s. It originated with black musicians who started calling their gospel-inspired jazz soul. The term soul caught on throughout black communities, leading to terms like soul brother, soul sister, and soul food. <laughs> According to soul food scholar Adrian Miller, soul food originated in the interior deep south, and that's Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. And that's where inexpensive ingredients like chicken necks and okra were turned into a heavenly meal. Mm -hmm. A perfect example is smothered chicken. Now we went down to Montgomery, Alabama to find out more about this iconic soul food dish. And today we're going to show you how to mm -hmm. make authentic smothered chicken at home. The key to great smothered chicken is not smothering the chicken flavor. Mm -hmm. And that's important because this dish is really simple and we really want that chicken flavor to shine through. And unfortunately, most recipes we tried early on, they overwhelmed the chicken with heavy sauces and way too many herbs. The trick is to let the chicken shine. We're letting the chicken shine. <laughs> mm -hmm. And speaking of chicken, we're starting with a whole chicken here. And this is a three and a half to four pound broiler. And first thing we're gonna do is break it down into pieces so that they cook more evenly. First things first, my favorite tool is a pair of scissors because it really easily goes through those chicken bones. I'm gonna cut up one side of the chicken back and then I turn it around and I cut down the other side. Now, I flip the chicken over and it's pretty easy to just to cut this chicken in half right through the breast bone. Now you can separate the leg from the breast pretty easily because the only thing holding it together really is a little bit of skin. So it slices right through. And these wings, we're not gonna use them in this recipe, but I definitely save them because I like eating wings on their own. Or if you notice, I'm saving that backbone because that's good fixings for stock. So I'll throw that in the freezer. Now I'm gonna take each of these breasts. So you see there's this tapered end and there's a thick end. Cut it in half, this side would be a lot thinner. So mm -hmm. actually about two thirds to that side, one third to this side. And then those pieces will cook nice and evenly. Right through that breastbone. Now onto the legs. There's this little hip joint here, and you can just cut that off. Again, stock fixings. Last but not least, let's separate the thigh from the drumstick. And there's this little line of fat, you can see it right there, mm -hmm. that helps denote where the thigh separates from the drumstick. And if you cheat it on the drumstick side of the thigh, you catch that joint right through the middle. Cheater. Cheater. There we see it again, there's that line. Go to the drumstick side of the line, right through. All right, so there is our chicken. Now we're just gonna pat this dry. Now, simplicity is key here. So we're not gonna do a lot of fancy seasoning, just a little salt and pepper on both sides. It's key here, Julia's working with raw chicken, so she went ahead and poured a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper into individual bowls so you wouldn't have to reach into the salt box and contaminate the whole thing. Well, no contamination here. This chicken is almost ready for the pot. One last step is we're gonna dredge it in some all-purpose flour. This does a couple things. It protects the chicken on the outside so it gets a nice browning without overcooking, but it also will help thicken the sauce at the end. So two things in one. So I'm just gonna take this chicken, dredge it lightly in the flour, pat off the excess, and that's it. Pretty simple so far. Yeah, no earth shattering news here in mm -mm. the chicken world. Keeping it simple, that is the name of the game today. Okay. Here I have a Dutch oven and I have some oil heating up. It's a quarter cup of vegetable oil. Heating it up over medium high just until I see those wisps of smoke. That's when it's time to brown the chicken. I can see wisps of smoke. I'm just gonna add half of the chicken to the pot because I don't want it to crowd because crowded chicken doesn't brown. And browning the chicken in this recipe is key. Because it's so simple, we really wanna taste the chicken flavor and the brown bits that that chicken leaves in the pot is crucial for the sauce. All right, this is all about simple steps building to big flavor. That's right. So this will take about six minutes or so. And of course, I'm gonna flip them over halfway through to get brown on both sides, okay? This is the second batch of chicken. Just gonna turn the heat off so they don't burn any of that good fond in the bottom. And you can smell it, it smells like toasty flour mm. and chicken fat. Yes, ma'am. Depending on the chicken you use, you may render a lot of fat or just a little bit of fat, but that can affect the texture of the sauce being greasy or not. Sure. So I'm gonna pour all the fat out and then measure back just two tablespoons because that's what we want for the next step. All right. 
Take this hot pot, pour this into the bowl. I poured out all that fat. I'm gonna put this back on the stove top. I'm just gonna add two tablespoons of this very flavorful chicken fat back into the pot. And we're saving the rest to make potato pancakes later. Ooh, that would be good. <laughs> I'm putting this back on the heat, and now it's time to make our sauce. Key to a good gravy and smothered chicken are onions. And this is two finely chopped onions. Next, a little celery. This is two finely chopped ribs of celery. A little bit of salt, a teaspoon of salt, and half a teaspoon of pepper. And now we're just gonna cook this for about six minutes or so until those vegetables are nicely softened. Mm, it almost smells like stuffing. It does, yeah. <laughs> Now we're gonna add just a little bit of garlic. This is three cloves of minced garlic and some sage. This is definitely an underused herb too. Mm -hmm. That's a teaspoon of sage and a little bit more flour. This is two tablespoons of all-purpose flour and of course that's gonna help the gravy thicken and cling to the chicken. So we're just gonna saute this until you can really smell the garlic and the sage. That only takes about a minute. Ooh, smell that sage and mm -hmm. it's time to move on. We're just gonna add a little bit of chicken broth. Again, keeping it simple. This is two cups of chicken broth. We're gonna whisk this in. And we wanna get up all the brown bits on the bottom and the sides of the pot and whisk out any lumps of flour. Oh, I know, it mm. smells good, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Now we're just gonna simply add the chicken back to the pot and cook it. Okay. Yeah, you said it smells good. We're about 10 blocks past smelling good. <laughs> You can see this liquid is starting to come up to a simmer, and that's a sign it's time to put the lid on. We're gonna turn the heat down to low. We're gonna let this braise for about half an hour. We're looking for a temperature of 160 in the breast and 175 in the legs and thighs. Okay. Bridget, it's been about half an hour, and it's time to take a good look. Oh, mm. whoa, the aroma that comes out of that pot when you lift off the lid. That's good gravy. Chicken and sage and a little bit of celery. Again, we're looking for a temperature of about 160 to 165 in the breasts. Ooh, perfect, 163. And usually the thighs and the drumsticks can take about five to 10 minutes longer. So I'm gonna take out the breast pieces and let those thighs and drumsticks go for a little bit longer. The thighs have been cooking for another five minutes. Now look at this sauce, it is perfectly thickened. Yep, not stodgy at all. Mm -mm. And now we're just gonna finish it with a little bit of vinegar. This is a tablespoon of cider vinegar, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and that's it. That's it? That's it. Smothering time. I'm just gonna pick up this Dutch oven and smother this sauce all over the chicken. And it makes plenty of sauce. Oh yeah. Enough sauce for the rice, because of course you have to serve this with rice. Last but not least, Little parsley. Perfect. Mm. There you have it. Very simple smothered chicken. All right, a little rice on the bottom? Oh, yes, please. Oh my gosh. Now, it makes plenty of sauce, no <sighs> worry. Oh, and a little on the rice. Smother it all. Oh, yeah. I'm just gonna have a little rice with some of the sauce on That's it. That's a good idea. Mm. I just love that flavor. I mean, it's just chicken with a little celery and sage. It's so simple, but so elegant. I've had a lot of smothered chicken. It just tastes like, literally, they fried some chicken, put a little bit of milk and flour in there. It doesn't taste like much more. Mm -hmm. This has an amazing amount of flavor. And the flavor of the sage and chicken, it is a really good combination. Incredibly satisfying and so delicious. Mm. Thank you, Julia. Oh, my pleasure. To make the very best smothered chicken in your home, well, the key is to enhance rather than smother that chicken flavor. Start by breaking down a whole chicken, then dredging the pieces in flour, and then brown them in batches. Build a simple but satisfying sauce by sauteing aromatics and the all-important sage in the chicken fat, then return all of the brown pieces to the sauce, and cook them until they are done. So there you have it from Cook's Country, a soul food classic, Southern style smothered chicken. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna smother my mouth with more. <laughs> Every great cook I know uses a kitchen timer to help keep track of things in the heat of the moment. But the question is, does brand really matter? Well, Adam's here to tell us if that's true. You have already used a key phrase, Julia, and that is heat of the moment. A lot of cooks are doing a couple of things at once in the kitchen, so it's got to be simple to use. That is our key parameter for timers. Mm -hmm. Also, it doesn't hurt if it will track multiple events at once. Before we get started, I have to say, 
This looks like it came from my daughter's toy closet. I mean, is this like my first timer? This I is ridiculous. I swear I have not been lurking <laughs> in your house. I have not been in the toy closet. I mean, what is this? This looks like something we have at my gym. That's going to be a new segment <laughs> for us. Equipment corner and then body composition. What are these handles for? <laughs> Back to the matter at hand, the timers. This is the one that we've tested in the past and liked. This is the American Innovative Chef's Quad Timer. Does a lot of things well but not everything. It's not quite as intuitive as we would like. Mm -hmm. And also you can't set it for less than a minute. So I went out, I bought 12 new timers to pit against this one for a total lineup of 13. The price range was a low of about $11.50 to a high of almost $50. Accuracy is obviously important for a timer and it's the digital age, these were all accurate. Oh, that was easy. We also did a little bit of abuse testing. We knocked them all off the counter, mm -hmm. we smudged them with dough and flour, and we swabbed them with sopping wet kitchen towels. <laughs> they all survived, so that's good. Let's get to this ease of use question, though, and that's where the kitchen testing comes in. Let's talk about these two. <laughs> My first timer and its yellow buddy over there. These were actually the two most expensive timers in really? the entire lineup. And even though this one looks like a toy, this was confusing. Testers could not get this to work without reading the instruction oh, manual first. No, any timer that requires an instruction manual, immediately out of my race. I am with you on that. That yellow one in front of you, it makes such a shrill, shrieking, terrible <laughs> alarm noise that it gave some of our testers nightmares. It's really an unpleasant <laughs> noise. This one, ease of use. See, the screen is on the front. Nice and big. Look, the buttons to set the timer are on the back. Oh. So you have to flip it front, back, front, back. That's when it falls on the floor. Now, the one in front of you. This guy. Check out that one. Try setting the time on that. What do you think of those buttons? Oh my gosh, the buttons are so close together and tiny. You actually kind of have to really maneuver a nail in there to touch the little plus or minus button. Now let's move on to this one. This one requires that you press two buttons simultaneously to set the time. Seriously? Two buttons simultaneously. And it was finicky. If you didn't get them exactly in tandem, you would end up adding time instead of resetting the time. That's ridiculous. What's more, there was a scroll up to add time, but no reverse. So if you miss your time, if you overshoot it, you gotta clear it and start all <laughs> over again. This one took the cake. This thing was absurd. Some of our testers got so frustrated they wanted to hurl it at the <laughs> wall. You have to <laughs> confirm that you don't want minutes if you only want hours. Oh, goodness. You have to confirm that you don't want seconds if you only <laughs> want minutes. So by the time you set it, your food's overcooked. Uh, seriously. In the end, it was OXO Good Grips that saved the day. This is the OXO Good Grips triple timer. It's about $20 and it has everything we could ask for in a timer. It's got a little keypad so you can type in the precise time you want. It's got a dedicated clear button. All three timers display at once so you can check what's going on with all your times at a glance. It's stable, it doesn't fall over. This is our new favorite multi-timer. So it turns out that the brand of timer you buy does matter, and if you want to buy the winner, it is the OXO at just about $20. Like many funny sounding fruit desserts, take slumps, beddies, or grunts, <laughs> Apple Pan Dowdy is an old school New England classic. As the great Dinah Shore once sang, Apple Pan Dowdy makes your eyes light up and your tummy say, <laughs> howdy. <laughs> it's similar to a skillet pie, but during baking, the crust is pressed into the filling so that the juices flood over the top and caramelize in the oven. I mean, how many desserts do you know that purposefully mess up the top? And that <laughs> is a process called dowdying. Now, the big question is, why did they dowdy in the beginning? Well, the answer is a lot of pie dough was very, very tough. Ah. Not as tender as we make it today. So they had to do something to actually make it edible. That's a good reason. And we're going to start with an all butter pie crust. There's no shortening and it's not only going to taste better but the shortening would have made it too flaky and too tender. Mm. So I've got three tablespoons of ice water and a tablespoon of sour cream. Just going to mix these together. Now our dry ingredients, we're going to do all this in the food processor. We've got two-thirds cup of all-purpose flour, a teaspoon of sugar, and a half a teaspoon of salt. And then I'm going to let this run for just a few seconds until it's well blended. So easy in the food processor. And now I've got six tablespoons of unsalted butter, really well chilled. Now I'm gonna pulse this about six, maybe up to eight pulses until that butter is really worked in. It starts to look a little bit like sand. So far, 
far, this is just like making pie dough. Pretty much, pretty much. And I want to show you the texture of this. There are a few pieces in here of butter about the size of large peas. So those aren't too big. Those aren't too big. They're going to continue breaking down more as we add our sour cream mixture. So we'll go ahead and pour this right in. About three to six pulses should bring all this together. You can see that there's no dry flour anywhere in there. And although it looks like a scattered mess at this point, that's okay. It'll come together very quickly. I'm patting it out to about a four inch circle. And this is going to go into the fridge for at least an hour. All we need to do now is wrap it tightly in plastic. Into the fridge it goes. We have well chilled pie dough. And now it's time to roll it out. Now I did let this sit out for about five minutes on the countertop. It's gonna be much easier to roll out. And now I'm gonna roll this out to a 10 inch circle. And I'm a little bit large. So is the dough. Mm, story of my life. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and squish it in just a little bit. And there we go. We wanna cut this into two and a half inch squares. The easiest way to do this is to go right down the middle, each side, and then the same this way. And it's dowdy, so you don't have to worry about it being perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and place this on here, these little pieces. Boy, it does make it a lot easier when you don't have to worry about it being perfect. <laughs> You're just cutting it into little cobbledy squares. Exactly. We're gonna cover these pieces, a little bit of plastic wrap, and this is going to go back into the fridge just so it can chill again about 30 minutes. Pie dough still in the fridge, time to make our apple filling. Now you know our go-to for apple baking is usually Granny Smith apples. Mm -hmm. They're fine, they're just a little too sour and they retain their shape a little too much, a little too much crunch. All right. So we're going with Golden Delicious. Ooh. Lovely, lovely flavor and they have almost a buttery flavor to mm -hmm. them. So this is two and a half pounds of Golden Delicious apples. Of course we peeled and cored them. These are half inch slices, so these are gonna cook down perfectly. We've got a quarter cup of packed light brown sugar and we love the little touch of molasses that brown sugar adds. We have a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, not a lot, and a quarter teaspoon of salt. Sure. I'm just gonna toss this until it's coated with that cinnamon and mm. sugar and, do we have to cook them? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. We'll eat the pie dough later. <laughs> now it's a pan dowdy, mm -hmm. so let's go over to our pan. We're using a 10 inch skillet here because we're gonna pre-cook the apples. So I've got three tablespoons of unsalted butter. It's just melting over medium heat. I'll go ahead and add mm, mm. the apple mixture. Wee, that's a full pan. That looks good. <laughs> I'm gonna put the lid on. We're gonna let this cook for about 10 minutes and during that time the apples will start to soften. I'll go in there a couple of times and stir it. And they'll also start giving off their juice. Now, this is three quarter cup of apple cider. Got a tablespoon of cornstarch because we want this to thicken and two teaspoons of lemon juice. We'll go ahead and whisk this all together. We're gonna go ahead and pour this right into our skillet. Now I just wanna bring this back up to the simmer. We're gonna let this simmer until that mixture starts to thicken. That's only gonna take two minutes. Isn't that one of the prettiest things you've ever seen in your entire life? <laughs> it smells life? amazing. It smells like fall. It Apple, does. cinnamon. Autumnal. <laughs> <laughs> so I've slid it off heat. I'm just taking my spatula and flattening the top a little bit. We're ready to put our pie dough right on top. What I like to do is just go right around the sides. There is no rhyme or reason. I like it. Yes, me too. Messy on purpose. So now we're gonna finish it off with a little egg wash. There this is a whole egg, beaten lightly. Just brush the top. Now we have a little cinnamon sugar, a tablespoon of sugar and a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon. Mm. That goes right on top. This is going to go into a 400 degree oven. You'll see a lot of bubbling around the edges, some nice color on the top. It'll stay in there for 15 minutes. It is time to dowdy. Mm, if you say so. <laughs> very, very technical way to dowdy here. You take a spoon, and you smush down in the middle <laughs> until some of the juices run over that center. Smushing, that's a technical term. Absolutely, you do it maybe four times around the edge. We're gonna put this back in the oven. Again, it's still 400. We're gonna leave that in there until you see it's really nice and caramelized on the top. That's about another 15 minutes. All right. Ooh, uh -huh. that smells good. Apple pan daddy. 
You can see as it bakes a second time, it kind of remends itself oh. and it puffs back up. Beautiful golden color. Of course, we cannot eat this right now. That's it's lava hot. So we're gonna let this cool down 20 minutes and then we'll eat the pan dowdy. All right, 20 minutes. I think it's safe. It's downright gorgeous. Absolutely. Let's dish up a nice big portion here. Gonna make sure that you get some of that apple and of course, oh. some of the beautiful shingles on top and lots of really flavorful sauce, of course. May I put some ice cream on yours? Thank you. I'm gonna put it right on the apples. Perfect. Oh, so it can melt right in there. Oh, that looks <laughs> I know. good. Well, something about the vanilla ice cream on the top, I mean, that's just gilding the lily. Those apples, the cinnamon. I was gonna say, the whole kitchen smells like cinnamon right now. Oh, that's good. Well, I love how the juices went mm. over the dough. You just can't get that with a regular pie nope. dough. And the apple texture? Really, really good. I mean, they've broken down just a little bit, mm. but they're not soupy at all. They still mm. have some of their texture. I don't know about you, but my tummy is saying, what is Dinah Howdy. 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 <laughs> Your eyes are lighting up as well. <laughs> <laughs> to make this easy, old school New England apple dessert, start by making a simple pie dough. Using a food processor, cut chilled butter into all-purpose flour, then add some water along with a little sour cream. For the filling, use golden delicious apples and cook them with brown sugar in a 10-inch skillet along with some cider and cornstarch to help make the sauce. Top the apples with squares of dough, sprinkle with cinnamon sugar, and bake it right in the skillet for 30 minutes, stopping halfway through to dowdy that crust down into the juices. Serve with vanilla ice cream, and there you have it. From Cook's Country, a terrific skillet recipe for apple pan dowdy. You can get this recipe, all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes at our website, cookscountry.com. Mmm, this is good. Cookscountry.howdy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>